Do, 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 do. <laughs> you like that, huh? Oh, I never get tired of the trumpet fair of Josh Clark. That's right. So that means that there's a new announcement for a new show. That's right. Uh, fans in San Francisco and the Bay Area in general and Northern California should not be surprised that we are coming back to SF Sketch Fest for, what is this, four years in a row? Uh, easily four, if not five. Yes, it is one of our favorites. It is the premier comedy festival in the country, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Yep. And we are always super happy that our buddy Janet Barney invites us back. Yep. So on Thursday, January 17th, Chuck, we are going to be doing a Stuff You Should Know live show at the Castro, right? That is correct. And the next day on Friday the 18th, we're both doing our own thing too. So you can see Josh and Chuck and then Josh and Chuck. Yeah, actually, I think I'm on uh, Saturday, but yeah. Okay, well, mine's on the uh, the 18th on Friday, and I'm doing an end of the world live show where you can come hear me talk about the end of the world and all the reasons we should try to not let that happen. It should be pretty cool. That's right. And I'll be doing my second ever live movie crush uh, with very special live guest, Busy Phillips. And uh, we'll be talking about the great, great Noah Baumbach classic film, Kicking and Screaming, one of my favorite movies. Awesome. So you can get all the information you need and tickets by going to the SF Sketch Fest website, uh, and they will have schedules, tickets, all that jazz. And we will eventually have links up, I'm sure, on SYSK Live. And we will see you, San Francisco, in January. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's Jerry over there. And this is Stuff You Should Know, the flowing podcast of all time. (laughs) Pretty great. You're getting good at those. Oh, man. You'd think after 10 years (laughs) I'd actually be decent at them. You're getting good. Getting sharp. 10 years, Chuck. Good Lord. Going on 11, dude. Yeah. You know? Yep. It's true. Eventually, it will be 11. That's right. And then 12, and then pretty much infinity after that, I would guess. Wouldn't yeah. you say? Uh-huh. I feel like we're almost daring each other to keep going at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Instead of doing that, Chuck, instead of just going on like this, let's do olive oil instead. Yeah, man. It's kind of cool that 10 <clears throat> and a half years in... Mm-hmm. You can still look around the world and say, or look in our pantry for that matter. Sure. And say, man, olive oil. That's yeah. a topic. Up next, those little cinnamon candy toppings that you put on cakes. <laughs> it's after olive oil. And obviously, it's just intuitive. Yeah. But Chuck, I think you should announce to everybody who wrote this uh, article for us. It, yeah, the Grabster. We've uh, we've been lucky enough to... Uh, to get the Grabster to kind of pump out more articles for us here in the near future. Yep. We grab the Grabster. That's right. It's super great because the Grabster does really good research and gives us good stuff. So we are basing this one on a Grabster article, which is just phenomenal. It's been a while. Yeah, man. So um, so there's a lot of pressure on Ed during this entire um, episode, I guess is what we're trying to say. <laughs> I think he nailed it. This is very thorough. It is. Yeah, he's he's good like that, man. And it is. Um, it's so thorough, in fact, that I think we should just go ahead and start at the beginning. The very beginning, which is basically where Ed started it. He fast-forwarded a little past the, the, um, the cooling of the earth, <laughs> but then picks up where, um, where olives actually started. And apparently in a 2013 study of um, chloroplast, no, chloroplast, um, DNA genes in olives. Apparently, that is a part of an olive that, like, from tree to tree along a lineage, the DNA gets passed along, so you can actually trace the lineage of trees. Some researchers traced the lineage of olives, domesticated olives, all the way back about six to 8,000 years ago, somewhere around the border between Turkey and Syria. That is where the first person said, hey, I kind of like the cut of your jib, wild olives, but I think I can make you a little better. Let me harness you and uh, force you into domestication. 
here you go into the ground between what will eventually be Syria and Turkey. Yeah, and that's like you were saying, just when people caught on to, you know, like domesticating a wild animal. Mm -hmm. uh, But wild olives, they've been around as long as olive trees have been around and olive (laughs) trees have been around. Like there's evidence that, you know, fossilized pollen and evidence that shows that tuk-tuk and all, Mm -hmm. all his gang, Mm -hmm. were eating olives. Right, yeah. They were eating olives and then so were their bird friends were eating olives too. Sure. uh, Wild olives are like, uh, I think, a little more bitter and they're smaller, which is why that that early um, horticulturist said, I can do better. I'm a human being. I basically own this planet. So I'm going to make this olive tree do what I want it to. And they did. They, they Olives grew bigger and less bitter. I don't want to say sweeter because that's not quite, quite the right word. But just less bitter, more edible. And uh, over time, they, they've they resulted in something like 700 different cultivars, which a cultivar is um, with olives or with any plant. It's a, it's a version of the same species, but it has different characteristics. Yeah, because of the human hand. Mm-hmm. The human hand, excuse me. That's right. So when we got involved and we said, hey, let's domesticate this stuff, we did so because of those reasons. Um, maybe we want different kinds of olives. Maybe we want to scale this thing and have an olive grove right. and get a higher yield. Maybe we want them bigger and fatter. Maybe we want them less bitter. So depending on who was growing them and domesticating them, uh, it really kind of varied on what kind of olive you were going to get. But the point is – there were lots of different kinds of, and still many, many different kinds of olives. Would you say 700? 700 cultivars from what I saw. Yeah, and they're all just a little bit different from their little buddy next to them. Yeah, at some point somebody said, oh, I'd love to see an orange olive. No one's ever done an orange olive before, and they just got to work doing that, and now we have, actually I don't think that it exists, but that's a pretty good example of what could have happened had somebody a thousand years ago said, I want to see what an orange olive looks like we would have an orange olive cultivar. That's right. But that's it. I mean, it's just basically difference in size, shape, also the size of the tree, the shape of the tree. Yeah. All, olive trees. Remember in our Pando um, episode? Oh, how could I forget? Man, that was a good one. I love Pando. I, I love Pando as well, Chuck. Um, but we were talking about long-lived trees. Olive trees are, like, pretty long-lived themselves, there's a, a couple that are supposed to be 2,000 years old, and I saw one called the Olive Tree of Vuves mm-hmm. on Crete, and it's thought to be 3,000 years old. And it's one; of, it's, it's just a perfect tree. Have you seen it? Yeah, the one in Crete? Yeah. Yeah, because Crete is, was the seat. Crete was the seat. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it says on all the T-shirts. The olive seat. <laughs> right. Back in the day, during the Bronze Age, I believe, um, Crete was like the, the seat of olive oil production for the world. And there's a temple at Knossos. I think that's how you say it, right? In the Case Island? Yeah, yeah. It's not Knossos. Okay. Um, That temple is thought to have housed, I guess at any given time, 16,000 gallons of olive oil at any any point. Like you could walk in there and you would find about 16,000 gallons in clay amphorae. Yeah, as and as far as the tree goes, like you said, they can, they generally are very old. They grow very slowly, mm-hmm. um, and like you said, they can range in size. It's it's pretty uncommon to have super tall ones because we have domesticated them to be a little bit easier to cultivate, uh, which means smaller and shorter. Mm-hmm. Uh, some are like shrubs sometimes. Uh, as far as North America and South America, they are not native to our lands, although. Um, they they do grow because Europeans brought them over. So now the United States and Mexico, uh, Chile, Argentina, and Australia mm-hmm. successfully produce olive oil outside of the um, obviously the Mediterranean region, which is still uh, I think Tunisia, Italy, and Spain are are the people who are really pumping that stuff out. Right, they're the leaders for sure. And the reason I mentioned our bird friends um, is because olives actually spread really easily. Uh, birds, I guess, are, eat the olives, poop the seeds out, which I feel bad for a bird because olive pits are fairly big, you know? Sure. I mean, if you were, I wouldn't want to poop out an olive pit. I can imagine if I were a tiny little bird, that'd be a big ordeal. But that's how <laughs> olive trees like spread. And since they thrive actually in fairly semi-arid conditions, 
Like too much water's not good for them. Um, they can survive cold snaps pretty well. Uh, they spread pretty easily, and they, they can be grown all over the place, not just in the Mediterranean. Yeah, and Ed, uh, I love how he put it here. Like, basically, don't take me or anyone else to task about all these dates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because domestication of the olive tree and the and the beginnings of olive oil could have started in different places around the world at different times. Yeah. Um, and he said, basically, it's not important to try and, like, nail down a specific date and region because it is conflicting. And what's important is is that the olive and the olive oil industry, uh, well, I guess it's an industry now, but back then it was just called olive oil. Sure. Um, it was super important. It wasn't just, it's not just oil. You know, it was important to religion and culture and mm-hmm. really had a had a big impact on these ancient empires. Yeah, he makes the point to say, like, this, this region that produced, like, the world's three major religions, or two of them at least, three of them, three of the four, the big four. <laughs> Where I'm going with that. Now, the big five, maybe? Jewish, Christian, Islamic, and Scientology? <laughs> right, the big four. <laughs> it, okay, let me just say that it produced three of the world's major religions. Yeah. Also, some of the great, er, great earliest cultures, um, they all came about in this place where olives and then olive oil production was pretty pretty widespread and plentiful. And uh, he doesn't go so far as to say, like, one necessarily influenced the other, but they were definitely intertwined. And it's it's you can make the case, like, you know, they didn't say, um, you know, chicken eggs are for the gods or something right. like that. Sure. Olive oil, is, it's special in its own strange way to human culture, especially the earliest um, faint, uh, faintest contours of human culture. Yeah, and so important that even the word O-I-L, mm-hmm. just for all the oils, is derived from uh, the Latin word for olive oil, specifically oleum. Mm-hmm. So you could, you know... You could even say that olive oil is sort of the the OG, the original oil. Right. And like Popeye's girlfriend would be olive olive oil. <laughs> That's right. Or <laughs> which is or o, just call her Oleum for short. Yeah. Ole that was his pet name for her. <laughs> uh should we take a break? I think so. We're starting to get a little charged up. Might as well defuse it and mellow out. <laughs> All right. We'll be back to talk about uh how olive oil played a part in all this culture and mythology. Let's all right, Chuck. So, uh, as I mentioned, spoiler alert, um, Christianity is one of the world's big three religions, and olive oil makes an appearance in it. Did you know that? I did. Um, well, olives do, at least. Yeah. And, and, and I, Ed actually over-delivered here, I think. Oh yeah, I agree. He was he was kind of showing his stuff. He got excited, <laughs> right? But we'll we'll go through some of these. Um, <clears throat> obviously, in the book of Genesis, if anyone's ever heard the story of Noah, mm-hmm. um, after the flooding, Noah sends out that dove and says, "Hey, dude, go out there and see what's what what we have in store for us. What's alive? What's dead? And give me a report." And the dove <laughs> said, "Sure thing, Noah," <laughs> and flew away and came back with an olive branch. So. It it might sound like, hmm, someone's under-delivering, Mr. Dove. <laughs> right. But what that meant was, is there's life out there because the olive tree is growing and everyone loves olives. See, right, there you go. <laughs> that was the implication. Chuck, you're basically a biblical scholar at this point. <laughs> Pretty much. But, I mean, think about it. The dove carrying the olive branch, like, that's almost worldwide. Somebody can point to that and be like, oh, sure. yeah, that's... That's a good feeling is what that symbolizes. We all know what that means. That means there's a fight coming. Right. <laughs> or somebody doesn't want to fight anymore. Right. So here's a, here's an olive branch that I taped to a dove and I'm throwing it at you. Uh, what else? Um, uh, oh, one of the things that struck me was that olive oil wasn't always used as um, food. It was used as definitely as a, an offering to the gods. It was um, portioned out very exactly and precisely, and we actually have um, tablets with linear B writing for the Mycenaean culture that show that it was um, 
taken very seriously. It was like, you get this little quarter ounce of olive oil, you get this quarter ounce of olive oil, sign your name here to say you got your olive oil Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then part of it even goes to the gods. Right, right. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. And they have to sign for it. They they do. Zeus. (laughs) Um, But then it was also used in bathing culture as well. Yeah. I mean, Emily has olive oil in her soap. Right. Okay. So this was a little less soapy than that. This is a little more straightforward, wherein you would take, I believe this was the Greeks, right? Or the Romans? Uh, What's the difference? No, it was in Athens. Okay. So the, the ancient Athenians would use olive oil that was infused with like an herb or something like that and pour it on their body and then use a stick called a sturgeon to scrape it off. And that was bathing. Part of bathing, I should say. I just made so many Italians and uh, Greeks mad. Oh, because you said it's the same thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, to be fair, Rome definitely modeled its culture sure. almost exclusively on classical Greece. So, I know. come on. I was just joking, though. Sure. They know that, Chuck. Give it. Give them a, I was just joking in like a stereotypical Italian accent. <laughs> That'll complete it. <laughs> it's just a joke, you know? Perfect, man. So, uh... Of course, ancient Egypt was involved. Um, It it feels like any time you're talking about some great, you know, from olive oil to peanut butter. Well, not Mm -hmm. peanut butter. You can go find it on the walls of the tombs of ancient Egypt. (laughs) Uh, And, of course, the Romans, just like it's either the Roman Empire or the Chinese are the ones who are going to make advances by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And, And in terms of olive oil, it was the Roman Empire who was like really got those agricultural techniques down pat for uh, kind of scaling it on, you know, as far as their scale goes. Plus, they were the first ones to really spread olive oil production beyond the Mediterranean and I think the the Middle East um, because the Roman Empire spread so far and because olive oil was such an integral part of that culture, they they took olive oil basically everywhere with them. And and olive oil cultivation or production, olive cultivation and olive oil production— went far and wide because of the Romans. That's right. And again, one of the reasons why they were able to spread this stuff far and wide is because olive trees grow pretty well in all sorts of different climates. As long as they're not overwatered, they're going to do okay. They like bright sunlight. They're hardy, evergreen, shrub-like trees. Um, But you do need a lot of water, though. You can get more olives by by watering them um, more than just neglecting them. But you don't want to over-fertilize them, from what I understand. There's like a lot of, they're really low-maintenance fruit-bearing trees, from what I can tell. But yes, they're, they're, you step up the fertilizer, you step up the water if you want to like do commercial olive oil production. But yeah. if you just have like an olive tree at home and you're just growing it for fun, <laughs> it's, you can go out of town for a while and not have to worry about your olive tree. Do you know who's into this uh, <clears throat> big time? Who? Uh, Chad Crowley. He's into growing olives? Well, he he's into olive oil and, like, to the point where, like, his retirement job might be olive oil, uh, like, olive farming and growing and cultivating. Does he grow olives? No, but he's he's into it, like, to a degree that I didn't fully understand until I talked to him about it. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh, we should tell everybody, all the um, millions of people listening who don't know who Chad Crowley is, he directed um, the, our TV show. That's right. Stuff you should know the TV show. He was the director, producer. He had a lot to do with it. And that scarred him so much that he just wants to go live <laughs> on an olive farm. <laughs> That's pretty much right. <laughs> so the fruit of the olive tree uh-huh. is the olive. Right. And they uh, they ripen to black, purple, uh, sometimes a little red. Um, if you see a green olive, that means it's not ripe yet. I did not know that. Did you? No, because I hate olives. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was... Kind of hoping that I had, like, imagined that, but no, no it's I don't true. like olives. That's crazy, man. I love olives. A lot of people don't like olives, dude. That's crazy. Whatever. <laughs> They're crazy. They're crazy. They're crazy. All of you crazy. No, it's called personal taste that we respect. I guess. Remember? I guess. <laughs> I keep forgetting when it comes to olives. Yeah, so as uh, the con- the oil in the olive... Um, increases as it ripens. So you mm-hmm. want them, it's kind of a a very tight line that you walk as an olive farmer because 
you want these things to ripen as much as possible to get the most oil. But if they over ripen and then just start falling off the tree, mm-hmm. they're no good. You got to pick it off the tree. So like winemakers, it's a very stressful thing to watch that crop. <laughs> I can imagine. And it comes down to sometimes the day or the hour of the day to really maximize your yield. Yeah, because if you think about it, you know, you have an olive tree with a bunch of olives growing on it. You have to time the the ripening of those olives, not underripe, not overripe. But also, not every olive on that tree is going to ripen simultaneously. So, you, so you, not only do you have to time it so that they're ripe, but the maximum number of olives on that tree are ripe at any given period, too. For sure. I'll bet, I'll bet that is super stressful farming, way more stressful than corn farming. Corn basically grows itself. You just sit around in your easy chair and say, hurry up, corn, get in your, your basket. Yeah, and then it just farts it off the tree right onto your plate, <laughs> the stalk. And does the little <laughs> bow and says, how do you do? <laughs> and you just clap from your easy chair. And, and say, I love like, corn trees. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, some, I mean, if you have a small farm and you're like an old uh, old family uh, business in, in Italy, let's say, mm-hmm. you might still be handpicking these things, uh, which is great. But big major operations, they have uh, what they call shaker machines, mm-hmm. and they, they drive through the farm and shake the tree. Have you ever seen one of those things? Yeah, and shaker machines are, I mean, it's not mm-hmm. just specific to olive trees. They use them for all sorts of fruiting trees. They just mm-hmm. They just shake it. They do. It's like the tree's like, and then uh-huh. it's like, oh, okay, that's over. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting to see. And then, like, there's, a, I guess, a catch that catches the stuff falling off the tree, and then it shoots it up a conveyor belt over into, like, a truck driving beside it. There you go. You just harvested a bunch of olives. Boom. But that's, a, that's like a commercial thing. That's a commercial Oh yeah, operation right. Like yeah, if yeah. you have, if you're like a mom and pop operation, like you were saying, or if you're you're harvesting from very very old trees, you would not use one of those machines. Yeah, you wouldn't want to go to a, a a thousand year old olive tree and and introduce it to the shaker machine. <laughs> no, that'd be mean. <laughs> that would be so mean. It's like I've seen empires rise and fall, and now some jerk <laughs> has got a new hall and shaker machine running yeah, right over me it, that runs on diesel. Yeah, thanks, Todd. So, flavor of an olive oil is going to depend on a lot of things. And and olive oil and wine, they grow in similar regions a lot of times, and they have a lot of similarities, uh, which is why often when you go to wine country, there'll be a wine shop that also sells olive oil Mm -hmm. or an olive oil store that also sells wine. (laughs) And you start to wonder, where's the line? (laughs) Dude, Yumi and I went to Calistoga in... Either Sonoma or Napa, I cannot remember. Uh-huh. I think it's Napa, and it, it's absolutely true. It's, there's like there's they're almost one and the same. You just go from a wine shop to an olive oil shop, but they're just it's the most amazing olive oil you've ever tasted in your life. Yeah, it's the best. I want so just to be clear, you hate olives, but you like olive oil, and I understand they're totally different. Oh yeah, I love olive oil. Okay. So have you have you gone to olive oil shops and just done like little shots of olive oil? Dozens and dozens. Aren't they just amazing? Yeah, man. I like the grassy kind. I like the nutty kind. Yeah. But it's and I think I've told you this before, really good olive oil can really give me like a chemical burn on my throat. Oh, really? So it has to have like kind of a buttery quality to it, I huh. guess, for me to really like it. Yeah, and this is the kind of olive oil that you don't, you're not like even cooking with necessarily. You're you're drizzling it on your salad or you're dipping your bread in it and stuff like that. Or you're injecting it for its anti-inflammatory properties. Oh, hold on. <laughs> okay. We'll get there. All right. <laughs> uh, but that flavor, like I was saying, like wine or, or the grapes that make wine – is affected by the the soil that you grow it in, the mm-hmm. climate, how much rain it got, the you know the general terroir. It really can change the the end product of that olive and thus the that oil that you're going to get. And you know the old school oil oil people, <laughs> <laughs> olive oil experts, let's say, sure, they'll say that you know if you really want a great olive oil, you won't even find it on some big mass farm. It's like you can find it the best stuff on like just an olive tree that's growing somewhere in Italy on somebody's property. 
Right. That wasn't necessarily raised for that purpose. And it's growing alongside other kinds of trees uh, and not like smashed together against a bunch of other olive mm-hmm. trees. Which is basically permaculture is what he's describing. Yeah, I guess so. You know, remember in the permaculture rep where it was like you grow crops with around other trees and other types, just a bunch of different types of plants together produce better crops? Yeah, but over there they just say it's a Italy. <laughs> right. Man, they're going to they're going to really be happy with this one. <laughs> I hope so. So, um apparently they also hybridize too. Yeah. Um which explains how we've gotten 700 different cultivars of of um domesticated olive plants. You just take a a tree that that does one thing really well, like produces big fat orange olives, and you take another tree that um does really well in a closet and you graft them together and now you have a tree you can keep in the closet that produces big fat orange olives and it's the <laughs> biggest freak of nature olive tree anyone's ever seen pretty amazing so chuck i think we kind of beat around the bush as it were <laughs> the tree long enough let's talk about how you actually make olive oil it's pretty cool because it's so easy mm-hmm. in in practice like uh as ed points out it's a stone fruit it's a droop like a plum or a peach where you have that uh, pericarp, that flesh on the outside, and then that hard seed right in the middle that you were talking about that a a bird's anus cannot handle. No, but unlike those other kinds of, like, say, stone fruit, you don't get the oil from the seed. There's some in there. You can get some from from there, but it's really hard to do. Um, What makes olive oil different from other kind of fruit oils or vegetable oils in general is that it doesn't come from the seed. The oil comes from the actual olive itself, which I guess that's what I would have thought, but I didn't realize that most of this, most of the oil we get comes from seeds, although it makes total sense because sunflower oil doesn't come from, like, the flower petals. It comes from the seeds. Yeah. But olive oil is different. It stands kind of on its own in that way, that you get the oil from the olive, the part of the olive you eat, the fruit. That's right. Boom. And, and the, the process of getting that oil is uh, starting, mm. startlingly, startlingly? Old-fashioned? <laughs> Simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you mash that olive, uh, we'll call it the flesh or the pericarp, you mash that into a paste, you press that paste to get the oil, and then you clean it up. You get a, There's a little bit of solids and a little bit of water left over, mm-hmm. and, you, and you remove that. Um, what has changed over the years is how we do that, because back in the day, you know, they would use stone wheels, um, like when you see like a donkey walking in a circle <laughs> attached to a... A, a contraption. Just hate in life. Hate in life. That's what that donkey's doing. It's rolling a big wheel in a circular path over and over all day long, smashing these olives into a pulp. <laughs> that pulp's called a pomace. Uh, and then finally, in the 20th century, they started using things like steel drum grinders or, mm-hmm. and this one would surprise me, um, hammers, mechanized hammers, mm-hmm. which is not a good idea. No, it's not. It probably seemed like a good idea in the 50s when they introduced it, and now they're like, this is this makes terrible olive oil. And somebody said, I know what we'll do. We'll just sell it for really cheap in the supermarket. And they said, genius. <laughs> yeah, it's because of the friction, right? Because heat, heat is no good. That's why mm-hmm. they call it cold press. Like, good stuff is cold pressed. Yep. Heat is no good for olive oil. It makes it... Uh, it just changes the changes the the taste. It does very much so. It introduces tastes you don't want. It can also paradoxically get rid of tastes you do want. Yeah. So you it's it's not good at all to introduce heat. And that's another reason why olive oil kind of stands on its own as far as vegetable oils go. With just about every other oil you you cook with, like a vegetable oil or a seed oil, it's um it's it, it heat is is necessary to get the oil out of the seed. With olive oil, you don't use heat, and so it preserves a lot of the flavors that you lose with other vegetable oils, which is why so many vegetable oils just taste exactly the same. It's like, is, did this all just come from the same vat? Where if you take a, a sip of olive oil, you know that's olive oil. There's no mistaking it whatsoever. Yeah, you, you don't c- want to take a sip of, like, just standard vegetable oil. You 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 don't want to, but you no. can. Well, I'm sure you could, but... <laughs> They're not going to put that on your plate with balsamic vinegar at a restaurant with a little pepper grind on top. It depends on the restaurant. You think? <laughs> yeah. I could see it. 
So the grinding process, uh, you have to do this long enough so the the malaxation uh, process emerges. And from what I gather, that's when actual uh, oil is released from these cells, and then they start to combine with one another Mm -hmm. until it's like recognizable oil. Is that about right? Yeah, like tiny, tiny little particle droplets start to combine into larger fat droplets of oil, and you just get more oil out of the 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 actual olive itself. Right, and that, that's that's just to get the pulp, pomacy pulp. Mm-hmm. And it's actually called pomace. It's not pomacy. Yeah, p o m a c e. Right. Yeah, but that's not the actual pressing of the oil. That comes next. Right, that's just the crushing of it to loosen things up, to kind of get the party started. The pressing is is number two. So the pomace or the paste is put in, traditionally, it's put onto mats or um, like, like wooden boards that have holes all over it mm-hmm. and then stacked. So you put like, say, a mat down, put some of that pomace on top of it, put another mat down, put some more pomace on top, and then you got a nice little stack going, and then you get a board, and then you go get, um, you know, Giuseppe, the human giant, yeah. to lay on top of the board and press down. Get the largest human in the village to exactly. come and sit on it. Right, and then <laughs> that actually, you're pressing the oil from the pomace, and all that oil is collected and, buddy, you've got the first hints of olive oil. And you could actually stop right there, and some people do. Yeah. Today, of course, they – I mean, the first thing they started doing was hydraulic presses because mm-hmm. Giuseppe was busy. There weren't enough Giuseppes to go around, I guess. Right. That's true. Uh, but today, a centrifuge, which I didn't know, uh, was is used, which is makes perfect sense because you get a centrifuge spinning, mm-hmm. and it's going to sling all that pulp to the outside – and, you know, the oil's going to gonna separate and leave that pulp behind, and there's no heat whatsoever. Right. They still call it cold pressing, even though it's not even being pressed, which is interesting. Yeah, I guess it's true. I hadn't thought about that. Like, they don't call it cold spun olive oil. <laughs> they could, I guess. Right. But uh, they still call it cold press. So when you see it on the bottle, that's what that means. There's been no heat or chemical processes mm-hmm. uh, to make that oil that you're about to delight in. It's all strictly mechanical. That's yeah, it. And, and it doesn't take long with these centrifuges. It's like it happens in minutes. Yeah, almost disappointingly, like you're like, oh, it's ready. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to wait for a little while. Um, so, so after that first press, w- whether, it's, um, whether it's with a centrifuge or whether it's actually pressed, you have olive oil technically right there. But there's usually a second step involved because, you know, most olive oil is very clear and see-through and beautiful. Sure. Um, maybe with a little bit of a green tint to it. Most likely some sort of kind of golden color. Mm. But there's another step to get to that part. It's it's just basically a filtration step. And for many, many, many years, several thousand years, I would guess, they basically just set the olive oil out to sit and filter on its own, to let the the um, water particles that were suspended in there and any little bits of solid matter from the olives left over that were still kind of floating around, they would eventually settle down to the bottom as sediment, and then everything on top was pure filtered olive oil. It's called decantation, and it took like four to ten months yeah. to get to that point, depending on the type of olive used, right? So if you want to mass market olive oil, you can't wait yeah. four to ten months. I'm sure plenty of people do, but you pay for that. That's the really, really expensive stuff that you're getting. It, what they figured out is you can use a centrifuge again, and you can filter out the um, the particulate matter and the suspended water, and now you have fully filtered, decanted olive oil that's ready for market. That's right. Then you've still got this uh, this pulp left over. This stuff that you've extracted the oil, but there's still a little bit of oil in there, mm-hmm. and they want to use everything. So this is when they actually use this heat. Uh, they use heat in a chemical process to get every single bit of that oil out, uh, and that oil is not something you want to you want to ingest. That's called uh, lampante, right? And that is like fuel oil. Um, and I love that Ed always puts in there in the industry. If you call someone else's olive oil lampante, that's like that's a 
what Ed calls a sick burn. <laughs> right. It's You're saying that their olive oil is inedible. It's only good to be used to, for fuel oil. Yeah, man. That's, that's pretty rough. <laughs> it really is. I think so, too. Giuseppe would, he would smash if he heard you call his <laughs> olive oil l- lampante. Giuseppe smash. So you want to take a break and then uh, come back and talk about whether olive oil is healthy or not? Yes and yes. It is. All right, Chuck. So everybody knows olive oil is healthy unless you've read articles that say that it's not healthy. (laughs) (laughs) It's just it's like uh, there's very few things that that demonstrate terrible science slash nutritional reporting than olive oil. It's all just very sensationalist. Yeah, here's the deal. Olive oil mm-hmm. is is a much better alternative than most other oils. Mm-hmm. It is a uh, a monosaturated fat, mm-hmm. which is always better than a saturated fat. It will it'll reduce your LDL cholesterol, which is the bad stuff. Right. And so, if you're replacing other oils with olive oil, they will say things in studies like. Um, you have a reduced rate of cancer or cardiovascular disease. Or it, inflammation. Yeah, it'll help uh, reduce inflammation, which we talk a lot about. Uh, it has vitamin E and vitamin K. And uh, all those things are good for you. But it's like that, that can't be good enough to the writers of health books and newspaper articles <laughs> right. or web articles. Right. Because they champion it as this miracle oil. Uh, that will make you live forever and uh, lose weight all at the same time. And that's not the case. Right. And it really kind of ascended in the modern West in the 90s thanks to the Mediterranean diet, which is basically like, look at the Italians. Look at how much pasta they eat. And they're all skinny and healthy and they live forever. What's going on over there? Yeah. There's a lot going on over there is the answer. There is. But a lot of people settled on, you know, olive oil is the key. It's the magic potion, as it were, right? Right. Um, It's not. It's good for you. But in, in it's good for you in the sense that if you're eating something and you're going to be using like vegetable oil, canola oil, and you replace it with olive oil, you've made a very good decision. If you sit around and just eat olive oil by the tablespoon all day long, that's bad for you. That's 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 too much of a good thing. It's more olive oil is really good stand-in for stuff that's far far less healthy than olive oil is. Yeah, and like uh, if you're on the Mediterranean diet and you say and looking at those Italians, Mm -hmm. you know, they're eating fish and they're drinking red wine and they're eating lots of fiber and they're walking up and down the steepest hills on planet Earth and they're uh, strolling the shores of Lake Cuomo and have a great family structure like low stress, like all these things combined. It's not like they shouldn't even call it the Mediterranean diet. They should call it being Mediterranean. Right. That's <laughs> you know? right. That's and you right. can't be from Atlanta and slurp down some olive oil and then pretend you're from the, the shores of Lake Cuomo. Right. Now, where's that bag of pork cracklings? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it is healthy, but just oil. don't, we can't over, or it shouldn't be overstated how healthy it is. Right. But on the other hand, there have been studies that say, no, no, no. Not only is olive oil not healthy, it's actually bad for you. Yeah, I don't know about that. Those have not been borne out in follow-up studies. But the the basis of the, that whole line of thinking was that when you apply heat to olive oil, e.g. cook it, or i.e. cook it, I'm sorry, everyone who loves <laughs> Latin, um, that that you're actually creating toxic compounds in the olive oil. Right. So you're actually hurting yourself. That apparently is not the case, that, that the um, amount of heat that we apply to olive oil to cook isn't enough to actually build up toxic compounds. And if anything, olive oil's um, smoke point is high enough higher than other kinds of vegetable oils, that it actually um, is less likely to build up any kind of toxic compounds through cooking. So the jury is still out, as it is on just about everything we understand about nutrition. But from what we can understand, olive oil is not actually bad for you. Agreed. It's not a super, it's not going to, it's not going to give you lasting life, but it's also probably not going to bring you to an early grave either. Yeah. Okay. That's a good way of putting it. Thanks, man. So, uh, 
when it comes to rating olive oil, because you go to the grocery store these days and, and there is a wide, wide range of olive oils you can buy. And this is just in your in your everyday supermarket. Like I'll, I'll get some of that good stuff there to cook with. But Emily and I have a, a store in Buckhead we go to, this lady that we know that makes her uh, own olive oils. And that's where we get our good stuff. Where? Uh, geez, I haven't been in a while, and I think she moved locations. At, but it's somewhere in Buckhead. Okay. There's one in Decatur, too, right in downtown Decatur. Okay. A great olive oil store. Good. Where you can taste, you know, shots and stuff. Is that Chad's? <laughs> yeah, it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the different grades, uh, they all have to do with the level of refinement. And in this case, the less refined, the better, because that refining process is what we talked about that will strip away that flavor over time. So extra virgin is unrefined olive oil. It's cold pressed, never heated, no chemicals. Uh, Sometimes you can find bottles that say first cold press, Mm -hmm. which means they didn't just keep pressing it. Uh, They just had the the one single press. That is the good stuff. And, And we'll get to whether or not you can trust this in a minute, but that's the top quality. Yeah, and apparently the highest top quality extra virgin olive oil is actually unfiltered. It doesn't go through that second step to remove the um, water suspended in it, the little particulate matter. It's unfiltered extra virgin olive oil. As, as far as health is concerned, if it is a healthy product, this is, this is the, the, it bestows the greatest health benefits. That's right. And supposedly is the tastiest. That's right. Then there's virgin olive oil, which apparently I've never seen in real life. Um, it's apparently very, very rare. But it's it's unrefined, but not as high quality as extra virgin olive oil. Yeah, maybe and, it's just what's the point so people don't even make it. Right. I don't know. And then there's straight up olive oil. If you've ever picked up a bottle of olive oil, like say in the supermarket and been like, well, it's 99 cents. That's a great price on <laughs> olive oil. <laughs> Yeah. And you're looking all over uh-huh. the label, turning it like, what am to I and missing? fro, <laughs> and you can't quite find where it says extra virgin anywhere, and it just says olive oil. What you have is all of, it's that's the grade of it, olive oil, or pure olive oil, and it's been bleached, and lye has been added to it. It's been heated, filtered, smacked around, um, just treated very, very poorly, and then ended up on your grocery store shelf for 99 Yeah, you cents. can use that on your bicycle chain. Mm, yeah, there you go. And that's about it. Or if you go to a terrible restaurant and they ran out of canola oil, <laughs> they might use this kind of olive oil for your, for your little plate with some bread. Uh, then you have light olive oil. This is more refined even, um, basically no flavor. Uh, and we should mention, though, that that standard olive oil, sometimes they do mix in a little extra virgin mm-hmm. to give it a little flavor and try mm-hmm. and charge a dollar nineteen. Yes, but they probably call it extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. Well, again, we'll get there. Okay. Don't believe the hype, everybody. All right. Um, but the light olive oil basically has no flavor, uh, and it, it is not lighter in calories. Uh, so that's is somewhat misleading. That's a big deal. Because you would think that if somebody sees a bottle of light olive oil, I would think like, oh, it's good. It's diet olive oil. It says weighs less. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Um, Apparently, and here we start to get, so there's also pomace olive oil, which um, that's lampante. It's it's not for eating. It's for burning, basically. Yeah, and then organic, like with a lot of organic things, um, there's no standard enforcement uh, enforcement body for organic right. in the case of olive oil. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but there's definitely, you shouldn't bank on that. But that kind of opens the door to this controversy in the bit, olive yeah. oil world, like where if somebody, somebody can slap organic on their olive oil bottle and charge you more for it, but there's no way for you to verify that it is organic. There's nobody watching things like that, even though there's the International Olive Oil Council and the, Na- the North American Olive Oil Association, and both of them are the standard bearers for uh, the olive oil industry, but they're just not big enough, and I guess their teeth aren't quite sharp enough to regulate this giant industry that's really boomed since the 90s. So there's nobody with the ability to actually make sure that the olive oil that's being sold is, say, like 
the purest extra virgin olive oil actually is extra virgin olive oil or is even olive oil at all. It could just be like plain old vegetable oil that has nothing to do with with olive oil and never has with just a little bit of um, extra virgin olive oil mixed in for taste. Yeah, because, I mean, they use, they have standards. They have like uh, actual standards for uh, the number of chemicals, uh, minimums and maximums and stuff like that. But it really comes down to human tasters, people that actually taste this stuff and say, no, this is metallic or muddy. There's no way this is extra virgin olive oil. Fail. Or fusty. That's another one. I love that word. Yeah, fusty. That's a this real word. This olive oil is fusty. Uh, but there just aren't enough mouths on these, uh, in these associations mm-hmm. to keep up with the massive, massive industry that is the olive oil industry. Right. And so the most pessimistic uh, people out there will say, 80% of the olive oils that say extra virgin are not. Right. 80%. And that's, again, the most pessimistic. But, I mean, let's just say it's 50-50. Mm-hmm. That's terrible. Yeah, it really is. Because, I mean, and it's terrible for a couple of reasons. One, you're getting ripped off. I mean, you might be paying for olive oil that is just not up to snuff and it's not as good as you think it is. That's that's bad enough. But if you're you're getting olive oil because you want to be healthier, right? Mm-hmm. And it turns out that it's not only good, not good olive oil, it's not even olive oil. You're not getting those health benefits. You may even be e- eating something more than you should, and it's actually just vegetable oil, which is actually not good for you in any way, shape, or form. Really, um, that's that's just bad. So you're getting ripped off, and you're you're being abused health wise. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, we kind of made fun of the 99-cent bottle that says extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. But you can get the $14 bottle, and that could be fake. It's Mm -hmm. not just the little cheapies. I mean, that's a pretty good warning sign. Mm -hmm. But you would think that if you paid, like, you know, for the $15 bottle next to the $7 bottle, (laughs) that that's the real deal. And that's not always the case either. Right. It's really BS. <laughs> I know, and I, I'm, I didn't run across, like, how you how you can be sure. But I don't I, know, I, man. I think there is no way to be sure. I bet do a little research on your own, find out about, a, you know, get a few brands that you know are, are doing the right thing and seek those out. I, and I want to say, like, well, if you go to, you know, Sonoma or Napa or, you know, Provence or somewhere where there's, they know what they're talking about with olive oil, you'd have to have, like, pretty – like iron cojones to open up an like a high end olive oil shop and sell vegetable oil. So surely that'd be a good place to do it. But then remember there was that whole Mass Brothers chocolate thing where they were just selling like melted oh, yeah. down Hershey's to everybody for like God. eight bucks a bar and everybody went for that. So yeah. I don't know. I, I I would guess you would have to befriend an olive oil producer who you knew and trusted, maybe let them hold some of your money for a little while, see what they did with it. Uh, And then when they gave it all back a couple of years down the road, then you could confidently start buying olive oil from them. And that's the only way. Or just, uh, well, maybe we'll throw Chad a little seed money. Okay. And partner with him. Sure. And then we'll just have our own supply. He's a trustworthy guy for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, there we go. wrong. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Uh, and then the final uh, thing we got to talk about, and again, I think Ed did a thorough job, but I feel like we could do like three or four more shows on olive oil. Why not? But we're not going to. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but the final thing here is olive oil's great. We all love it. It's it's the best oil to me, aside from sesame oil, which I also love. Um, but it it is it is not great for the environment. The mass production of olive oil has some pretty big drawbacks to it. Yes, I had no idea about this. Yeah, and it made me like go, oh man, I knew that was a catch. Always something. It's always something. Um, So when you produce olive oil, that that stuff that you press all the oil out of, the leftover olives, that's called olive cake. Mm. And apparently one of the things that's left over from this stuff are phenols, which polyphenols are actually kind of good for you Phenols can be toxic. They can be irritants. They can be really bad for you if you ingest them orally. And when you make olive oil, you have all this leftover olive cake. And 
when you spread it out there in the fields to just kind of get rid of it, it runs off and contaminates the local water supply. Um, the water that's used to create olive oil, it uses a ton of water. And the wastewater can actually be treated in typical municipal wastewater plants because it's too toxic. Yeah, and again, that's bad. This does not mean that your olive oil is toxic. It's the stuff left over or f- that comes from the production of olive oil that can be toxic to, to people and bad for the environment. So, yeah, there's like a big environmental impact, especially in small um, rural areas where like the whole local economy depends on yeah. olive oil. They don't have the means to dispose of the stuff properly um, to, uh, where it has the real, you know, environmental impact. But it's bad for, for everybody. It, just because it doesn't in, impact you over here where you're enjoying the olive oil doesn't mean you're not also still responsible for the, the impact that's going on halfway across the world where the olive oil is being produced, you know? Isn't it amazing that they can treat human poop wastewater but not olive oil wastewater? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it is. We can put a man on the moon who can poop up there, <laughs> and we can treat that, but we can't treat olive oil wastewater. Uh, the good news is, is as we speed into the future, um, there are new methods of reducing the amount of waste, uh, and there are new methods of uh, detoxification mm-hmm. for that waste to be a little less harmful. Uh, and they're looking at other things that they can do to help uh, – put some of that waste to actual use, um, like as fuel or, you know, stuff like that. So, I mean, they're, they're trying to get it under control, but it, it is a black eye for sure. <laughs> they, uh, they are feeding as much as they can to Giuseppe, who's just <laughs> ingesting it and metabolizing this stuff, but he, he can only eat so much. Poor Giuseppe. Uh, you got anything else? No, although I have a feeling if I traveled through southern Italy, mm-hmm. somebody would grab me at some point and say, hey, come on, uh, sit up on the, sit on the olives. Will <laughs> you be the Giuseppe stand-in? Sure. <laughs> sit on the, well, in a second. If you tour southern Italy, bring me back some olive oil, will you? Okay. Okay. Um, well, if you want to know more about olive oil, you can't. There's nothing more to know because Ed covered it all for us. Good job, Ed. Um You can type the words olive oil into the search bar of your favorite search engine, and it will bring up a whole world of stuff for you. Just beware. Remember, about 80% of it is not real. Uh, Since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Oh, no, it's not. You know what it's time for. (laughs) Oh, yeah? You want me to say it? Yeah. Administrative Details. That's right, Josh. This is when we thank listeners for small tokens and large tokens yeah. of, uh, of love and appreciation, uh, appreciation they've sent to us <clears throat> here at the Atlanta office. And I'm going to start it off with uh, Lori from Minneapolis, Minnesota, who uh, very sweetly sent my daughter a Frida Kahlo action figure. Sweet. Because I talked about how much she loved Frida Kahlo, and she mm-hmm. loves, loves, loves it. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Laura. That was very nice of you. Uh, I'm going to start off with Jim Sias and the Crown Royal team who styled us out again. Yeah, man. With some fifths of Crown Royal and some very cool rocks glasses that mm-hmm. have like the little crown on the piddle, pillow, like in a hologram etched in the middle. Yeah, and it weighs like a pound and a half. Yeah, it's got some real heft to it. Plus they sent us candy glass. too, which is pretty nice. That was very nice. Uh, John Nordskog sent us, boy, remember John, he sent us the, uh, he calls it a code wheel. Mm-hmm. What we should probably do is just put a picture of this thing up. He um, he, he built it for, a, I think, a Boy Scout troop um, and then repurposed it as a, good, a wonderful gift for us. But it is, we now have it hanging up on the wall of the office, yep. John. We finally got it up. It is this huge handmade thing of wonder of interlocking gears and cranks that turn and you and it eventually will spit out uh, a paper code. I don't even fully understand it yet, but it looks <laughs> so, like something from the ancient past. Yeah, and, and it's just pretty amazing. It looks really cool in our office. It's daunting, yes, it, and yeah, we can't understand it. So it's definitely going to be a, a wall piece from now on. Yeah, and imagine John spent a fortune shipping that thing too. So mm-hmm. uh, many, many thanks, John. Yeah, and I think we thanked John last time, but that was a far better thanks. So way to go, Chuck. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, we got a uh, we got a lot of great gifts when we went to Australia for our tour. Oh yeah. Um, one of them was Janet from Nano Girl Labs in New Zealand gave us a beautiful hardcover edition of their book, Nano Girl Labs book, uh, the Kitchen Science Cookbook. And you can look up kitchensciencecookbook.com. And it has all these different recipes in it. And each recipe is a science experiment that uses ingredients that are super easy to find and super cheap. And um, it turns out Janet, the chief operations engineer for Nano Girl Labs, has been listening to us since her teens, since she was in her teens. So I feel old, but thank you very much for that awesome book. Yes, for sure. Uh, Emily Cool and Joseph Baxter sent us uh, an invitation to their wedding in Idaho. Nice. Mazel tov. Wish we could have gone. Uh, and Cam and Sonia, so they came to our Melbourne show. Um, and remember, they gave us the Tim Tams and the eight-year-old Tawny Port. Oh, yeah. For, so we could do grown-up Tim Tam slams. And I tell you, that's the only way to do Tim Tam slams. <laughs> it's with Tawny Port. It's amazing. Delicious. If you don't know what Tim Tams are... Go to your local world market and buy some and thank me later. Yes, for sure. Uh, Krista Allenstein sent us art. Uh, here's what she does. She takes prints of atlases, uh, roadmaps, and stuff like that, and then paints over them with little sort of throwback kitschy motel signs. Nice. Uh, and she sent us the Ohio and Georgia. Mm-hmm, they're beautiful. you're from Toledo mm-hmm. and I'm from Georgia. That's right. <laughs> they're very cool. Yeah, thank you for those. Um, Jack Hawkins works at Starward Whiskey. Uh, remember that? The Starward oh, Whiskey yeah, yeah. that we got at the Melvin show? Uh, we got some from him, and it is beautiful stuff. You can check it out at starward.com.au. Allison Gallagher, she's uh, one of my movie crush buddies. She sent, uh, she sent me a mug, uh, so this is probably a movie crush thing, of a Triceratops that says crushing it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. It's very cool. Bill, this has to do with movies, but I don't know if it was movie crush. Bill Wagoner sent us the DVD of Mongol. Oh, yeah. Remember that, the was, one, that was for us. The one version of the Genghis Khan story that's, that didn't star somebody like Omar Sharif or um, the Duke. That's right. <laughs> it was like actually a good movie. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, ben Floor, F-L-O, uh, F-L-O-R, sent us uh, his... Uh, this is very cool. Reusable carbon fiber drinking straws. Mm-hmm. Um, plastic straws are a very cause de jour. Um, people should stop using them as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, I saw a little stat the other day that said they take um, like 10 minutes to make, 20 minutes to use, and stay in the environment forever. Wow. Uh, so Ben has a company called L- L- Luster, L U S T I R. Mm-hmm. where he makes these carbon fiber drinking straws. They come in a little carrying case that you can just throw in your car or your purse. And if you like to drink out of straws, then <laughs> you can carry it around and bring your own straw and say, no, thank you. I have my own straw. Yeah. It'd be like um, medieval times where everybody had to walk around with their own spoon. And if you lost your spoon, <laughs> you starved to death. That's right. Um, big thanks to Brad Ashmore for sending us his book of short, weird fiction. Had he worn a different body? Ooh. Mm-hmm. I remember that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Angela from Tasmania sent some lovely, lovely knitted hats from Australian mm. Wool. Nice. Thank you, Angela. Um, we got a an awesome drawing of us from Eugene Gorman. He did an awesome pencil drawing of us, and you can see it and all of his other stuff on Instagram at Gorman Eugene. Check him out. John D. sent us hand-painted portraits. Uh, you can go to johnd.com, actually, J-O-H-N-D.com, to check out his art. Thanks, John. Those are uh, very cool. Uh, the last one I've got is from Ryan N., the 30-year-old engineer who is apparently still tells people his age when he says hi. <laughs> he, he sent in a pack of Pilot Friction Erasable Pens. Oh, right. They disappear with heat and reappear in the freezer, and they are pretty awesome. So Amazing. thanks a lot, Ryan. That's, um, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm, just, still, I'm still a G2 guy, but that's those are nice <laughs> pens. All right. I just got a couple more. Uh, William Dawson sent uh, Ukulele for Music Teachers and Music Therapists. It's a book that he put together about how the ukulele 
can uh, be used as music therapy. That's awesome. Uh, and it's very cool. And I do have a ukulele, so I'm going to I'm gonna take a look at that for sure. you got a future side career ahead of you. Then. <laughs> uh, and then finally, of course, uh, our buddies, uh, Lowe's, Hillary and Mike, uh, Lozar sent us uh, along in their collaboration with Flathead Lake Cheese mm-hmm. in Montana. They sent us uh, Stuff You Should Know, Stuff You Should Know Specific, mm-hmm. Hoppin' Mad Gouda Cheese. So good. And we always get that flathead like cheese from them every year, and uh, it's just super, super kind. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It is. When we get that cheese. Also, I want to say, um, we haven't heard from Little Bit Sweets in a long time. I hope they're doing all right. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hit her up. It's been a minute. Please do. Uh, well, if you want to send us something, that is very nice of you. But you don't have to send us anything. You can just drop a line to say hi. You can go to our website, stuffyoushouldknow.com, and check out all of our social links. You can find me hanging out on my website, thejoshclarkway.com. And you can send me, Jerry, Chuck, Noel, Matt, Frank the Chair, and everybody an email at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.